speaking of ancestry, Darwinian evolution, we have one very fundamental problem. Would that be fundamentalists pretending to know things they don't know and, as we say in the South, talking out of their ass? The scientist discovers a progression. There is a progression from lower forms of life to higher forms of life. You can actually map it out and it fits like a puzzle. Very convincing. The notion of higher or lower forms of life fell out of fashion over the last couple hundred years or so. Evolution is not a ladder nor a progression like the illustrations you've seen from so long ago. Evolution is about biodiversity and it is the only explanation of biodiversity, scientific or otherwise. Of course, that means that some things will eventually become more complex, more derived, more specialized or whatever. Question, fundamental question, besides the missing link. There is no missing link, or at least there's no link still missing. Now, Charles Darwin predicted that if his theory was correct, then we should find a fossil form in Africa that was morphologically halfway between humans and the African apes, gorillas and chimpanzees. The link that was then still missing in the evolutionary chain, as it was known in the 19th century, was eventually discovered about a century later or a half a century ago. It was the famous fossil known as Lucy. If you were awake in the last 50 years, and I'm sure you've heard of her, so where have you been, Rabbi Van Winkle? Did you take a long nap? Because to be honest, I still think you look like you might be sleepy. No, Lucy was not a hoax, nor was she a knuckle walker. Her and her kin were certainly upright walking bipeds who could not be confused with chimpanzees. Though I know how creationists like to lie about that and pretend otherwise, we know better and we can prove it. Ever since that first no longer missing link was discovered in 1974, hundreds more individuals have been found from that species along with dozens of other intermediate species on either side of the halfway mark that that form represents. The fundamental question is what are we seeing? When we see this progression, what are we seeing? Are we seeing ancestry or are we seeing sequence? Both and neither. I have to assume that you're referring to Rudy Zalinger's famous painting called March of Progress, painted in 1965. This image has since become the iconic illustration of evolution, which is unfortunate because it is deceptive, as you'll see in a moment, and because it appears to adhere to the antiquated notion of a chain of being, which was already out of fashion even before he painted it. It is important, though, because it does illustrate a realistic lineal transition, but that sequence was not necessarily through all these species named herein, nor in precisely this order, either. There's a lot to explain here, and I don't think anyone has ever done that, at least not on YouTube, so allow me. First, when we look at the superfamily Hominoidea, the clade colloquially known as apes, there is, as is typical throughout taxonomy, a deep division between two main groups, in this case between the lesser apes and the great apes. We know that the earliest apes would have been smaller, looking more like gibbons and siamangs than like gorillas and chimpanzees. That's why Zalinger begins his procession with Pliopithecus, which was not found in Africa or Asia, but in Europe, in France, as it was 11 million years ago. Pliopithecus means more ape, meaning that it is a Catarine or old world monkey that is more ape than other monkeys. Here it is used to represent the earliest apes. But one of the defining characteristics of apes is that the tail is absent. And Pliopithecus had a very short tail. So do we, technically, but ours is reduced as much as it can be without losing vital functions. The tail of Pliopithecus was slightly longer, just long enough to be visible on the outside. Another illustrative example would have been Egyptopithecus from at least 30 million years ago, but that fossil wasn't discovered until 1966 when this painting was published in the Life Nature Library's volume on early man. As the name implies, Egyptopithecus was discovered in Egypt, so it was African, not European. Egyptopithecus was described by paleoprimatologists as a monkey-like ape, and that gets us to Zollinger's second in this sequence, 
proconsul, who was described by paleoprimatologists as an ape-like monkey. Thus, we have our transition into apes from monkeys happening roughly 20 million years ago. The proconsul is still generally considered to be the most basal of all known apes, while the next one in this sequence, Dryopithecus, is considered to be basal to great apes, meaning that they're older and more primitive than chimpanzees or gorillas and that being an intermediate form between the lesser apes and the great apes, and dating to about 12 million years ago. Dryopithecus was already known in Darwin's day, but since then several other fossils have been found, mostly in Europe, that all seem closely related. So that the Dryopithecus is not a single species, but an informal group of closely associated species, which includes the next one in this march. Oreopithecus is now one of several European apes to be associated with the Dryopithecus collective. One of the interesting contrasts between these first four in this march is that Zellinger has Proconsul and Pliopithecus walking bipedally, where evidence shows that both of these actually walked on their hands. A likely Dryopithecus fontana may have as well. However, some of the Dryopithecus association species, like Oreopithecus, were evidently bipedal. So Zellinger got the first two wrong, which is weird, because if he had painted them the right way, then it would have been more consistent, going smoothly from quadruped to biped. So it's curious why he got that wrong. We know now that our ancestors evolved in Africa, while each of Zellinger's troops so far were European, until the fifth one. Ramapithecus was Asian and not part of our ancestry, but necessarily included here to show a connection to pongids like orangutans and other fossil forms like Sepapithecus and Gigantopithecus, the largest ape known ever. Taxonomically, there would have to have been a common ancestor connecting pongids with the other hominids, and Ramapithecus was as close as they knew back in 1965. The next page of this four-page fold-out illustration are not just hominoids, apes, and they're not just hominids or great apes, they're hominines, the humanoid lineage. We're already past the divergence from gorillas and chimpanzees, so this list skips Aurorin tugenensis, as well as Artipithecus ramidus and Cadaba, because they hadn't been discovered yet. Because remember that this was painted in 1965, and although it seems as if we have already a rich collection of transitional intermediates, most of the human family tree was actually discovered years after this painting was published. That's why Australopithecus afarensis, the fossil known as Lucy, the missing link that Darwin predicted, is not on this list. Back then, that link was still missing. Her species wasn't discovered until a decade later. If she were on this list, then she and her kin would likely be in between Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus robustus, which shouldn't be here, because they were a side branch. I don't know which species the one labeled advanced Australopithecus was supposed to represent, but I suspect that it's Paranthropus boisei, because Australopithecus divided into two groups as well, as most clades do. On one side are the gracile Australopithecines, like Africanus and Afarensis, as well as some others that are missing from this list, like Australopithecus anamensis, Baral Grozelli, Daria Ramida, Garhi, Prometheus, and Sediba. Then you have the robust Australopiths, also known as Paranthropines, Paranthropus robustus, Boisei, and Atheopithecus. So these two represent a side branch that should not be depicted as being in our lineage. Another one missing from this list is Kenyanthropus platyops, which wasn't discovered until 2001. It is popularly considered to be intermediate between the Gracile Australopithecines and the earliest humans. The earliest humans are not of this list either, which is confusing. Homo habilis was discovered in 1960, so it ought to be here. Zellinger could have known about that one if he'd kept up to date. However, Homo rudolfensis wasn't discovered until 1986. So it's understandable why that one is not listed here. The last two pages of this foldout are all relatively modern humans, but there's still some confusion about that too, and a few more missing persons as well. Homo erectus definitely belongs in this sequence right where he is, but this turned out to be a hugely diverse species who lived throughout Africa, Southern Europe, and Asia into Indonesia from 2 million years ago until about 100,000 years ago. There was so much physical and doubtless cultural variance within this one species as to render our current notions of race laughably trivial by comparison. Consequently, some human fossils that were originally thought to be different species are now understood to be varieties or races of Homo erectus. 
One listed here as Solo Man is now recognized as one of the subdeems of Homo erectus. This is where Zollinger got some things out of order. The one before Solo Man, called Early Homo Sapiens, and the one after him, Rhodesian Man, are both now regarded as Homo heidelbergensis, or perhaps Homo antecessors, discovered in 1994. Thus, they should be intermediate between Homo erectus and Neanderthals. Except that Neanderthals shouldn't be on this sequence at all, because they're not in our lineage. That was the biggest mistake Zellinger made. We did not descend from Neanderthals. Instead, if we think of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals as brothers, then the father of both would be Heidelbergensis, and Homo erectus would be the granddaddy of them all. The last two, Cro-Magnon man and modern man, are the same thing. Cro-Magnon are not a species and consequently should not be on this list, as they were only ancestral to those with European ethnicity. And modern man had already populated Africa, Asia, and Australia by then, and Cro-Magnon is just a subset of modern man so they're even out of order. Of course, the March of Progress is also missing Homo floresiensis, discovered in 2003, though they shouldn't be in this lineup anyway, because although they were another human group, they were not in our ancestral lineage. They're a sideline that ended in extinction. Then there are the Denisovans, who are known primarily from DNA, discovered in 2008, though they may be the same race as Homo longi, known from a skull in China whose discovery was kept secret for decades until 2018. They were more closely related to Neanderthals than to sapiens, although they were close enough to integrate with Melanesian people and a remnant of their genetic lineage can still be found in the people of South Pacific. And finally, there is Homo naledi, a more primitive human discovered in 2013. Had Zelliger known about them, he likely would have put them between Australopiths and the first humans in this sequence. They were actually contemporary with Homo erectus, Neanderthalensis, and archaic Homo sapiens, so they probably don't belong in our direct ancestral lineage either. So, Rabbi Friedman, I hope that answers your fundamental question. Yes, you're seeing both ancestry and sequence, though not as clearly as it could be, nor as correct as it should be, because Rudolf Zollinger was a fine artist, all things considered, but he was not a scientist, and his artwork is not science. One scientist said, people who are worried in the inner cities, people who are worried about the ecology, came up with a brilliant idea. To camouflage um, the dumps, Old cars get piled up in dumps, and they're ugly. The solution is cover them with earth, grow some grass, and you have a nice hill. It's a nice idea. He said, imagine a thousand years from now, scientists will dig up those hills, and they will discover that the further you dig, the bigger the car gets. And so there's a sequence here. In the 60s, the cars were very big. Then they got smaller. And then they got smaller. And then they got smaller. And then they got bigger. <laughs> How sensible would it be to claim that the big cars gave birth to the little ones? Do cars give birth? Did the car from that movie with James Brolin get together with Stephen King's Christine and give birth to Disney's Herbie? Do cars reproduce on their own like living things do? Or do we have to build cars because they cannot reproduce? Is there a factory somewhere where they make animals? Or do we not have to make them because animals can reproduce on their own? Do reproductive populations change over time such that there are now different species of dogs, cats, cattle, ducks, and so on, that we know and can show are all biologically related to each other? Is that sort of evolution observable, both in the wild and in all forms of domestic livestock and in agriculture as well, so that we know that it works? If so, then your analogy about cars has failed, and you should be embarrassed at how stupid that argument was. Well, look at the progression. Come on. 
You see, the fin was this big, then it became this big. Come on. It's not just that. The study of taxonomy is so much more intricate and detailed than that, where we see new clades emerge in the fossil record and diversify, where we can follow different lineages expanding into wider diversity. When Carolus Linnaeus tried to classify all living things in 1735, he realized that everything was in a nested hierarchy, a family tree of daughter groups descending from parent groups, from an enveloping lineage of ancestral groups. He was a creationist who realized this a century before Darwin, and he couldn't explain it because he had no concept of evolution. Nor did he know anything about fossils, which later provided intermediate forms connecting most of these groups, like between birds and reptiles, and between mammals and reptiles, amphibians with fish, and so on. Then eventually, Darwin provided the explanation that Linnaeus couldn't figure out on his own. Yes, there is a progression. But what does progression indicate? A sequence or an ancestry? If we can't resolve that question, then we're just guessing again. We're not guessing. The sequence already implies ancestry because we know that living organisms change over time. Unless you want to pretend that your God is a tinkerer who learns from his own mistakes by trial and error and who replaces his old experimental models with new and improved ones. That is the sort of God that uh, Sir Richard Owen believed in, but few believers have ever agreed with him. When we discovered genetics and realized how we could compare the genomes of living groups, it again confirms the evolutionary taxonomy and phylogeny already indicated by these other sciences, so that we know they were related. We can prove that now. Our genome shows human migration out of Africa over the last 100,000 years or so, and this study of molecular phylogeny of living primates shows how the origin of our species is definitely nested within the family of apes, just like Darwin said, and the fossils also implied. God says, on the first day I created light, on the second day I created a heaven, on the third day I created vegetation, on the fourth day... There's a sequence. God never said any of that. Mere fallible people said all of that while pretending to speak for their God. And they obviously had no idea what they were talking about, that's why they got everything wrong, even including the sequence. The smaller animals were created first, the fish, the birds, the bugs. The big animals were created later, and the human being came after that. So you think that the fossil forms of fish and birds and bugs were created first because they were small? Which doesn't make any sense, because you also think that God conjured all the fish and all the birds on the fifth day and that all the bugs were created alongside men on the sixth day. Every species, all on the same day. For bugs, that means things like Meganeura and Arthropleura, to say nothing of the giant Eurypterids. For birds, that means giant moas and terror birds that would have been eating people if we were around then. And for fish, that means Dunkleosteus from the Devonian period, Rhizotus from the Carboniferous period, and the massive Leedzichthys from the Jurassic period. These are not things you fish for. They come hunting for you. Except that all these things went extinct long before people showed up. Yet you think that all these geologic periods were in the same week? That all these things were alive at the same day? And that they were created first because they were small? You don't actually think about things before you say them, do you? you really just rely on willful ignorance and make-believe to rationalize things you don't know anything at all about? Correct. The sequence makes sense. So you accept our evolutionary ancestry then? Who said anything about ancestry? Well, that was supposed to be the topic of your talk today. You posted this lecture under the title, Evolution versus God. Rabbi disproves Darwin. Rabbi disproves evolution. Each part of your title is wrong. You didn't disprove evolution. You don't even know what it is. At this point, I doubt if you could spell it. But evolution isn't anti-God either, because many of the pioneers and champions of evolutionary theory have been, or still are, believers in God. Practically everything you say is false. Why aren't you embarrassed about that? What you've done here, Rabbi Friedman, is 
like an irresponsible high school student who forgot to study or even compose his presentation before it was due. If that's not good enough for a student, then how much worse is it from a teacher? <laughs> you know, people say that you buy a dog that looks like you. You know, sometimes you see a similarity between the dog and its owner. Well, it, it's a fact. There are similarities there. Is there ancestry there? <laughs> Boy, that dog looks like you. Well, what are you implying? I mean, is that the opposite of, boy, your children don't look like you? <laughs> That's scary. But that the dog looks like you is not scary. It does not imply ancestry. So you're saying that it's just coincidental that we have all these transitional fossils blurring the lines between humans and apes, that we share all these traits that define us as apes ourselves. You're saying that that's just a coincidence too, that it doesn't really mean anything. But if we didn't come from apes, then why are we still apes? Not just morphologically, taxonomically, but genetically too. By the way, without, without going into the whole... Uh evolution the species evolution of species what do you mean without going into that that's what you were supposed to do how are you going to disprove darwin without getting into the evolutionary origin of species how are you going to disprove evolution if we don't get into that what how different is a human being from a chimp chimpanzee genetically very little I think 89% of our genetic codes are similar. No, there are two ways to measure it. If you only look at protein coding DNA regions of the two genomes with inheritable single nucleotide differences, then we are 98.8% .8 identical to both chimpanzees and bonobos. Basically, there's only a difference of 1%. And this is the way most genomic comparisons will be, as we'll discuss in a moment. If, however, you were to go outside of that to include changes at the larger level, loss of whole genes, rearrangement of gene order, loss or gain of chromosomes, then the difference between humans and chimps climbs to 4%, being 96% identical. The only way anyone ever got an estimate of 80 some odd percent was when an incompetent creationist fudged his figures to get an unrealistically low number deliberately deceptively. 89% of our genetic code. 99, rounding up from 98.6. This does not mean that a chimpanzee is 89% human. Doesn't mean that at all. No, because chimpanzees and bonobos both differ from humans by that 1%. We are all three 99% the same thing. It also doesn't mean that a human being is 89% percent monkey no we are a hundred percent monkey because a monkey is any member of the taxonomic suborder of primates within a clade known as anthropoidea meaning man-like that clade is also known as simiaforms which essentially means monkeys and that grouping includes old world monkeys and new world monkeys if you list the definitive characteristics of all monkeys opposable thumbs two pectoral mammae uh, these kinds of ears that we all have in common, a dangling penis, uh, not tethered to the abdomen like a dog's penis, for example, binocular color vision, and so on. If you list every trait that defines monkeys and that is held in common by all monkeys, not just certain ones, and you describe people. And the difference, the vast difference between a human being and a monkey is not in the genetic code. There is no vast difference between humans and monkeys, just like there's no difference between a mallard and a duck. We are monkeys in the same way that a duck is a bird. Again, Carolus Linnaeus noticed this way back in 1735, when he challenged the scientific community of his day to show me a generic character 
one that is according to the generally accepted principles of classification, by which to distinguish between man and ape. I most assuredly know of none. If he couldn't tell the difference, then the difference cannot be all that vast, at least not collectively, taxonomically. And consequently, rather than classify man as a subset of apes, as he should have done, Linnaeus classified apes as a subset of man. Specifically, he classified chimpanzees and orangutans as different species of humans. He wasn't the first one to do that either. The word orangutan means old man of the forest, because it doesn't matter if you find them foreign or familiar. People commonly regard them as though they are virtually human. So it's not impressive to say our genetics are similar. We're not that dissimilar from an elephant either or from a flower, from a dandelion. Incorrect. And we will have a substantial commonality, a profound degree of genetic similarity with every form of life. For example, our genome is 30% similar to that of daffodils. We share half of our genome with bananas, and those are both plants. The more closely related we are on the phylogenetic tree, the more similar we will be. So there would usually be a higher percentage with virtually any animal our genome is 65% similar to fruit flies, for example, and 70% similar to slugs. Then with other vertebrates like chickens, then we get up to 75% similarity. I couldn't find a peer-reviewed study showing our genetic similarity to elephants, but um, as they are placental mammals, as we are, then the degree of similarity should be about 80% or so because we have higher than 80% similarity with other boreo-eutherian mammals closer to us, like dogs and mice. It was hard to tell because some of these comparisons I found online were counting homologous genes or measuring whole genomes rather than orthologs. One I did find showed that Asian elephants are 90% similar to African elephants, whereas we humans are 99.9% .9 identical to each other. So in round numbers, we are all 100% human, 99% like chimps and bonobos, 98% like gorillas, 97% like orangutans, and 96% identical to gibbons. That means that all apes, including humans, are more closely related to each other than elephants are to other elephants. That's how different we are from the elephant or a dandelion. It turns out our genetic similarity to the other apes is pretty impressive after all. All life is made up of the same stuff, more or less. The question is, what distinguishes one life form from another? It's not just the genetics. It's taxonomy, although classification is phylogenetic now, so it is their genetics. In fact, what determines the genetics? ancestral phylogeny, literally their evolution. If you list only the definitive characteristics that distinguish old world monkeys from new world monkeys, like downward pointing nostrils or uh, a tail that is shortened or weakened or absent altogether, flat fingernails instead of claws, the dental formula that all old world monkeys have, that then you describe people. Whereas if you describe new world monkeys instead, well, now you're talking about something else. Within old world monkeys, if you list all the definitive characteristics of apes, the ability to brachiate and the te their tendency toward bipedalism, you describe people again. And if you list the characteristics of the subset of apes known as great apes, with the number of body-wide hair follicles, the specific type of dentition that we have, uniquely identifying fingerprints, and so on, you describe people again. So you can distinguish humans among apes, but you can't distinguish humans from apes. If everything in the universe is made up of atoms, then we're all related. <laughs> then not only can the smaller car be the descendant of the, of the larger car, we can be the descendant of a larger car. Hey, hey we're both made up of atoms. Molecules. How is it that when the clergy needs to hire a wise old sage, they so often give the job to 
someone so stunningly stupid instead. Her job had only one requirement besides being Jewish. You have to show some amount of appreciable wisdom. <laughs> you fail that spectacularly because everything you say is so obviously false. When your synagogue hired you, they must have been desperate to take anybody. Oh, he's got a beard. He looks like a garden gnome. Get him. The stuff of existence is not what creates the distinctions. It's their function and their purpose that makes them different. In fact, it is the function and purpose that determines which, gen which genes you're going to have, what kind of genetic code you're going to have, and what kind of DNA you're going to have. Not the other way around. Are you talking about natural selection right now? Because that is the only sense in which there is any truth to what you just said. Otherwise, you're just wrong again. Or should I say still? Because you've been consistently wrong on every single point you've tried to make for a while now. It's not that your genetics determines what you are. What you are determines your genetics. You know who disagrees with you? Geneticists. Even the ones who believe in God and the Bible. Even they disagree with you. But Francis Collins was a, an evangelical Christian when he led the Human Genome Project. Yet he says that, unfortunately, Adam and Eve are genetically impossible because there's no way we could have developed this level of diversity from a single couple however many thousands of years ago. Instead, he said the evidence in the genome shows how we emerged from larger populations of primates much further back in time. And one of his team was one of my instructors in biology, and she explained how your genes determine what you are. There is no other way around. So when God said, let there be grass, he meant, let's have a set of genes or molecules that acts like grass. When he said, let's have animals, he meant a set of stuff, the building blocks of life, that behaves like an animal. And when God created this rabbi, he wanted something that behaves like an animal on grass. I'm sure your students or your congregation are glad to have you clarify what God meant to say, as if you know the mind of God so well that you can correct God or clarify his omissions. If that were so, then why didn't God step in to stop you from making such a fool of yourself while you're representing him? If God is so jealous and vain and vengeful, then why doesn't he correct you? Why doesn't he stop any of his other spokesmen from discrediting him with such embarrassing errors all the time? It's almost as if he's not even there, not even listening, just letting all y'all make up whatever nonsense you like, even when you contradict each other, as if none of the clergy of any religion really knows what they're even talking about. The... The basis of evolutionary theory, of Darwinian theory, is basically two principles on which we speculate and expand, extrapolate. The two fundamental principles of Darwinian theory are basically this. Number one. All living organisms descend from other living organisms. That which is alive is a descendant, was born to that which was alive. Living things come from living things. Darwin didn't say that. In fact, he once said the opposite of that, pontificating on how life might have formed in a warm little pond, perhaps. Now you're confusing Darwin with Rudolf Virchow, a pioneer biologist who said that cells come from cells. His biogenetic law was misinterpreted to mean that life only comes from life. But Virchow also said that diseased cells come from other diseased cells, but then he had to admit that there must have been an earlier cell that wasn't already diseased. 
Logically then, there must also have been a first living cell that didn't come from another living cell. It must have come from what he concluded to be a prior matrix. Now, Thomas Huxley later described this by coining the term abiogenesis. But I have to add that abiogenesis is a separate series of chemical processes prior to evolution, because evolution is the theory of how life diversifies, not how life began. The second fundamental principle is that living things didn't always have spines. That in the early stages of life, there were no spines. Now, if you take these two principles, these two assumptions, you basically come up with the evolution of species. Because if all life comes from life, and originally life did not have a spine, then we have evolved from non-veterates to veterates. That's vertebrates, not veterates. Vertebrates, things with vertebrae, not veterae. That's it. That's the whole theory. Funny how Darwin's book was 459 pages with no pictures. Instead, it was full of explanations, analyses, and predictions, some of which came true. So that is not the whole theory, not even close, not even the basics of it. I suspect that many of your students were already fact-checking you on their cell phones. If they figure out how full of shit you always are, will they think that all rabbis are as dumb as you? Do you want them to leave the faith just because you're so bad at this? Just for the fun of it, I googled this myself to see what your students might see. And what I found searching for the fundamental principles of Darwinian evolution are, one, that most characteristics of organisms are inherited or passed from parent to offspring. Two, more offspring are produced than are able to survive. The capacity for reproduction in all organisms outstrips the availability of resources to support their numbers. Thus, there is competition for those resources in each generation. Both Darwin and Wallace were influenced by an essay written by economist Thomas Malthus, who discussed this uh, principle in relation to human populations. Three, Darwin and Wallace reasoned that offspring with the inherited characteristics that allow them to best compete for limited resources will survive and have more offspring than those individuals with variations that are less able to compete. Because characteristics are inherited, these traits will be better represented in the next generation. This will lead to a change in populations over successive generations in a process that Darwin called descent with modification. Ultimately then, Natural selection leads to greater adaptation of the population to its local environment. That is the whole theory, if we limit it only to Darwinism, what little he and Alfred Russell Wallace had figured out on their own back then. Now, of course, we know a whole lot more. The extended evolutionary synthesis of the 21st century is much more robust than Darwin could have imagined. Does that mean we came from monkeys? It doesn't mean that at all. And Darwin is probably turning over in his grave, <laughs> or as Yogi Berra says, if he were alive today, he would turn over in his grave <laughs> at the suggestion that he thought people came from monkeys. That's a lot of uh, sensationalism that was added on to his theory. The taxonomy was different in Darwin's day. The scientific community could not answer Linnaeus's challenge to distinguish man from ape. So what they did instead was to create a separate taxon for apes to include all of them except for us, which is already a Freudian admission that we are one of them. Actually, when I was a kid, it was still that way. The family Pongo was for all the non-human apes that are currently alive such that fossil apes didn't count as apes simply because they were extinct. And since fossil ancestors of modern apes could not be considered apes themselves, then they were called ape-like ancestors instead. They were intermediate between apes and humans by that old way of thinking, then they were called hominids. And they did the same thing with monkeys. 
insisting that apes could not have come from monkeys because monkeys are still alive. Except that paleoprimatologists kept finding fossil monkeys and admitting that they were monkeys. And these included propyopithecoid monkeys, which were evidently basal to both circopithecoidia and hominoidia, meaning a fossil monkey that was basal to and potentially ancestral to both modern monkeys and apes. I know that confuses you, Rabbi Friedman, because you think of chimpanzees as monkeys. For centuries, chimpanzees and gorillas were not monkeys. They were apes. And we were not apes. We were human. But today's taxonomy is cladistic, monophyletic. And we see that our evolutionary ancestors weren't just ape-like. They were apes, and so are we still. And likewise, now we see that chimpanzees are monkeys after all, because so are we. Uh, just in the last 20 years or so, genetic studies have confirmed that Linnaeus was right. The arbitrarily contrived invention of the Pongo family was wrong, so it all had to be revised and corrected. Now, Pongo is just a genus of Asian apes, orangutans, etc., but they and all these so-called great apes are now regarded as hominids, whether they're in the human lineage or not, because we're all in the subfamily hominidae. As we understand these terms today, Darwin did, in fact, argue that humans came from ancestral forms that we now regard as apes and monkeys. He claims only two things. Life comes from life, and life didn't always have a spine. Which really doesn't mean much in terms of ancestry. Darwin said a whole lot of things, but not that. Certainly not just that. The vast majority of living things still don't have a spine, and they never will. Because not having a spine doesn't describe anything. So scientifically speaking, you can't say that which has a spine evolved or devolved from a form of life that didn't have a spine. Because you can't de define something by what it doesn't have. That's why invertebrates is not a taxonomic clade, but vertebrata is. Vertebrates have a vertebrae. All the other phyla or subphyla are not in an invertebrate category. There is no invertebrate category. That's just how we colloquially refer to everything else. All those other phyla or subphyla that are not vertebrates are classified by whatever traits each of those other groups do have. So you can't say there were creatures without spines. That doesn't mean anything. Strawberries don't have spines. Did we evolve from strawberries? That's why science doesn't do that. Back in the 18th century, Carolus Linnaeus thought of life as being divisible into seven ranks, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. But that is at least an order of magnitude more complex than that now. Just in the named clades. Here is a list of 70 named clades within the parent category of life, biota. As I explained in my playlist on the systematic classification of life, every one of these clades is defined by traits that those organisms did have. And in our case, we still have the defining characteristics for every one of these ancestral clades, because these are just the ones that pertain to the human ancestral lineage. If you doubt that, I'll put a link to the series below, and you can check it out yourself. Secondly, all life comes from other living things? Don't think so. Before the Big Bang, there was no life. You don't know that. You don't know what there was or wasn't at some point before the Big Bang in a prior form of the universe, perhaps. That is irrelevant here because we're only talking about life on this planet, not everywhere in the universe, nor in every universe or version thereof. On Earth... All the evidence we know of so far implies some sort of common ancestry, at least for eukaryotes, if not for prokaryotes, too. Life comes from dead things. No, it doesn't. Not if dead means formally alive. That would be spontaneous generation, a supernatural belief in vitalism that was disproved by Louis Pasteur, among others. If by dead you mean material that was never alive, then we all accept that there was once upon a time when there was no life on this planet, and then there was. 
Scientists say that that happened naturally. Mystics say that it happened magically, supernaturally. We all agree that it happened somehow. No one has shown that there is a supernatural anything to consider, but we do have dozens of peer-reviewed experimental studies so far showing various stages of the natural development of biochemistry. Which brings us back to the cutting edge question. How does nothing become something? It doesn't. Creationists are the ones who believe in creation ex nihilo, out of nothing, believing that their immaterial God created material, but not out of other materials, out of nothing. However, evolution is the study of population genetics that doesn't have anything to do with where material came from. Evolution does not hold that everything came from nothing. Even the Big Bang cosmology doesn't hold to that. So you're criticizing religion now, your own religion, not science, not evolution. Once it becomes something, science can take over and come up with wonderful theories. But until it becomes a something, we're clueless. Speak for yourself, ZZ Stop. I don't understand why you or your students prefer to be stupid and wrong rather than smart and right. What is the payoff from your blinding and bewildering irrational ignorance? We'll find out in the next and final episode of this series.